Sean Penn and his wife Robin Wright, along with John Travolta, star in She's So Lovely, one of the new summer movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Sean Penn won the Best Actor Prize at this year's Cannes Film Festival for She's So Lovely, but to me the mystery is why his wife, actress Robin Wright, didn't win in her category. She's remarkably good in an equally tough role, playing a working class woman, a pregnant drunk who at the start of the picture is worried about her missing husband, a man with a history of mental problems that result in violence. Hello, police. I'd like to report a missing person. Hold. Yeah, I'll hold. Hold that. Robin Wright, of course, played the hippie Jenny in Forrest Gump, and she's miles away from that character here. And her tough guy husband, played by Sean Penn, freaks out when he does learn that she was beaten up and raped by an abusive neighbor. Oh, yeah. And now oh, the monkeys oh. are in the trees. You're in uniform. I respect the military. Soldiers, one, two, one, two. I have a gun. You have guns. Fair. To draw, we count three. One, two. After that act of violence, Penn is sent to a mental institution where he spends the next 10 years of his life. Meanwhile, his wife settles down with another man, played by no less than John Travolta. He's not at all thrilled to learn that his wife's former husband is back on the streets. To force the situation, Travolta invites Penn back to the house for dinner in a scene that combines black humor with a genuine sense of danger. Do what I tell you. Joey, can I talk to you for a minute? Talk. Never mind. Make up your mind, babe. I want you to stay. He wants you to go. She's So Lovely is based on an original script by the late great American independent filmmaker John Cassavetes, and it was directed by his son Nick, who declares himself as an original talent, I think, with this film, separate from his father. And I thought this last picture that he made, Unhook the Stars, which he co-wrote, I thought that came off as a bad John Cassavetes film. But She's So Lovely plays as a truly original collaboration between father and son. And unlike most movies where Hollywood stars play working class characters, I didn't feel as though anyone was slumming in this story. It felt real. And She's So Lovely constantly surprised me with its story. Thumbs up. Thumbs up for me, too. And you know, one of the things I liked about the daring of the Cassavetti screenplay is that it breaks in two. There's a whole story. Right. Then there's ten years. And then there's another story in yeah. which... Uh, some people moved on and other people have not moved on That's and so the past is dragging in the present and in a way it's almost as if Cassavetes is asking this woman uh, to consider two men who are aspects of the same personality just as in many of his other movies women are involved with guys who on the one hand are violent and irresponsible, yet on the other hand are loving and material. Well, that's that great title, and A Woman Under the Influence. And yes. what is she under the influence of if not a man in her life there as you well are. as other yes. problems? And so it's, it's really, it, it's an interesting way of approaching the problem. And then the acting, as you say, is really fun. Absolutely first rate. And I appreciate that John Travolta is taking not the lead in a picture. In other words, that he went for this screenplay is smart on his part, well, too. Well, he's going for the role, and that's a good decision. Okay, next movie, the year is 1934 and Harlem is in the middle of the Great Depression but hope is cheap because you can buy it every day with a number in the policy game. Thousands of dollars are paid out and many more thousands are earned. In the movie Hoodlum the numbers are run by Stephanie St. Clair known as the Queen of Policy and played by Cicely Tyson. But the downtown racketeer Dutch Schultz wants to muscle in and take over. The Queen meets with Bumpy Johnson played by Lawrence Fishburne who is fresh out of prison with some new ideas. We ain't gonna crease like Brenda or Miro. <laughs> some you win, some you lose. We got a problem. She's gonna fall. I ain't talking about her. Bumpy confronts Dutch, played by Tim Roth, in the Cotton Club. I'm here to tell you, you're shutting your operations down. Tomorrow, you don't, 
I shut you down myself. Dutch's superior is Lucky Luciano, who Lucky thinks Dutch is making a mess of the takeover. He's played by Andy Garcia. As I said before, I have no quarrel with any of you gentlemen. But if Mr. Schultz insists on coming uptown, I have no choice but to make my presence felt downtown. Well, you realize that such a course of action will bring about your demise? Dutch's been trying to bring about my demise for quite some time. I'm not Dutch. Yeah, you lucky. What's interesting about Hoodlum is that it's not just a violent period crime picture. It's seriously interested in a crucial turning point when Harlem, in the middle of a cultural and artistic renaissance, was challenged to control its own rackets along with everything else. The mob wanted in, and Hoodlum suggests it would have been a lot better if uptown crime had been left the way it was. The movie was directed by Bill Duke, who shows a good sense of period. And the film is interesting, not just for its drama and romance, but also for its history. I wasn't interested in it, Roger. I, I'll tell you, I, I've pretty much, I'm tuning out. They had The Last Don on television not too long ago. Mm -hmm. The whole crime area, I think you have to make a really great picture to get anyone's attention with the whole mob anymore. And whether it's a black mob, white mob before, it's 13 years since the Cotton Club, which took this uh, material and I thought did a very good job with it. Francis mm -hmm. Coppola, of course. Uh, this stuff bored me and it is a terrific cast i don't think the care i know all these characters cold roger i mean and that it, i don't know it, i think the one thing that was really new in this movie was the way that luciano really didn't like that schultz and didn't really much care what happened to him and so he kind of sits up like the puppet master and lets them fight it out below and also i thought that the relationship between the queen of policy between Cicely Tyson and Lawrence Fishburne was very nicely handled. I, I, Roger, all of these people, but it, it's so mm -hmm. simple. The mobster playing one off another. My God, well, we've seen I it I liked all. it. I thought it was atmospheric. I thought it was dramatic. I've I seen the it was well acted, I've seen I enjoyed the, it. I've seen the atmosphere before. I've seen the story before. It didn't interest me at all. Coming up later, Paperback Romance, a comedy about a beautiful woman who writes erotic novels. Conversation with you would be the most exquisite form of foreplay imaginable. And coming up next, Alicia Silverstone refuses to stay in the trunk when she's kidnapped in the offbeat comedy excess baggage. I have plans tonight. I made them before I was kidnapped. Are you aware that your friend has kidnapped me and keeping me here forcibly against my will and you're an accomplice? No. Hey, you gonna uncuff me? Alicia Silverstone stars as an unhappy kidnapping victim. Are there happy ones? Well, she wanted to be, and I'll explain in a minute, in the very funny comedy, Excess Baggage. After being so cute and clueless, Silverstone shows she's pretty good at that most difficult actor's task, selecting another good starring role to play just after you've hit it big. Excess Baggage has an original sense of humor. She found this screenplay, apparently, and gets co-production credit on it. Silverstone playing the daughter of a very wealthy man, bored and starved for attention. She concocts a plot to fake her own kidnapping and collects the ransom. She hides in the trunk of her own car, which is promptly stolen by a petty thief. When she manages to get out, she phones her father's hired gun, who she calls Uncle Ray, Christopher Walken. I, I don't know what to do. I can't get out. I tried all the doors. Everything's locked and there's bars everywhere. Maybe I could talk to someone. Someone? Someone who? Whoever's letting you use the telephone. How could I get to a phone if there was someone here? I'm telling you, I need help. The car thief, played by Benicio Del Toro, eventually returns, and they end up having the essential love-hate relationship of this movie. I'm not going to hurt you. Just could you please get in the truck? Look, can I just wear this cap? Look, I can't see anything. Call up some fingers. I can't see anything. How stupid do you think I am, huh? They're awfully cute together. Another complication is that the unintentional kidnapper and his partner, played by Harry Connick Jr., lose a bag full of mobster money, $200,000 worth. Relax, it's not your problem. What the hell do you know what my problem is? They think we set this whole thing up together, for Christ's sake. Why would they think that? Oh, gee, uh, maybe because they're criminals, and criminals think the worst of people. Excess Baggage was directed by Marco Brambilla, who made Demolition Man with Sylvester Stallone. This film is a lot better. It has a lot of surprises in its story, and also some memorable characters, such as the one played by Christopher Walken, who I think makes almost his every character in every movie indelible. I liked Excess Baggage. Thumbs up for me. Thumbs up for me, too. What I liked best about it was Benicio Del Toro and that yeah. weird accent or way of yes. talking and the whole way of carrying himself and the whole way of relating to the world that he creates. Yes. And this is not his personality. We've seen him in other roles. And he, out of, out of thin Nothing. air, creates a character 
who is absolutely individual and exactly specifically who that person is. You would think is. this is what an actor gets paid to do all the time. Yeah, but it's boy, really he does done. It. He, he does a very good job. And Alicia Silverstone, again, she well, could have been typecast mm -hmm. as, you know, the rich girl. And I know she is a rich girl, but it's not the same role. I thought she was only fair. She was fair. Okay. That's the best I can say. Coming up, Anthony LaPaglia falls in love with a girl with a secret in paperback romance. Yeah. Paperback Romance is a very odd picture. It's from Australia, which may explain why its comic sensibility seems so odd to a guy, namely me, who was used to seeing pictures with, you know, the American Saturday Night Live juvenile sensibility. It's the story of a woman who writes racy romance novels and a slick jeweler who eavesdrops on her writing of the latest. So I thought to myself, am I about to actually speak to the most fascinating woman I'm ever likely to meet? Or should I just turn my back and walk away and pretend like this never happened? I'm not sure anything has actually happened. Well, that's Anthony LaPaglia as the jeweler, and what he doesn't realize is that this lovely lady with a wicked imagination, played by Gia Carides, has one leg that is paralyzed from childhood polio, so she walks with the aid of crutches. But after accidentally breaking that same leg, she gets a different set of crutches, and that provides her with a cover story to explain the way she walks. Everybody assumes it was a skiing accident, and that leads to more disabilities, including one for LaPaglia himself. He was eating an ice cream in an outdoor cafe. When the chair he was sitting on collapsed. And his jaw hit the table as he fell. The plot gets further complicated when LaPaglia finds himself at the altar with another woman. I don't know why I'm going through with this. Well, for once we agree on something. Don't you dare talk to me like that, you, you cheap little crook. Now, you can probably figure out the rest of the story, but what you may not be able to figure out is the way the film blends outlandish physical stunts with sexual fantasies and some thoughts about disabilities. In fact, what I like about the movie is it suggests that an important disability is the inability to feel passion. Paperback romance has passion, it's a light, funny film, and it gets a marginal recommendation from me. I'm kind of on the fence on this one because even though there's a lot of stuff that doesn't really work, I mean, they're trying to muscle in plot that isn't necessary. Nevertheless, the characters are really engaging. Yeah. I like this relationship. I like the scene, for example, where he can't talk and she okay. turns out to be the translator, although she usually yeah. translates into funny. saying what she wants him to say rather than what he's really saying. There are lots of things like that in the movie that really work if only it had just been about the character well not i think so much a, I th about the slapstick. i think there are enough scenes there and let me just put it this way don't you want to see this jeer caridis in another movie sure yeah she's got a lot of talent and she's playing smart you know sometimes in, when, in american movies when they have a character mm -hmm. with disabilities that also means they lose their brain because they only can play a victim she's smart she's dealing with it You're a lot right. better than an american well, screenwriter well, there's a, a lot there's a lot of original stuff in this movie yes it is okay. give it a thumbs up okay coming up next a first look at two newly restored movie classics and one of them features peter laurie's creepiest role in theaters around the country and will soon be on video. One of them, Fritz Lang's 1931 thriller named M, has probably not looked this good within the living memory of most mm -hmm. people. Even my Laserdisc version of an earlier version of this film is scratched and faded and the subtitles are sparse. But now, this restored version translates more of the dialogue, makes it easier to follow the story of a child killer played by Peter Lorre, who in this early performance establishes his lifelong screen image as a psychopath. And look at this amazing shot of the faces of the city's criminals who have captured the killer and now sit in judgment on him. Du hast da was von Recht gesprochen. Wir sollen Recht werden. Hier sitzen lauter Sachverständige in Rechtsfragen. 
von sechs Wochen Tegel bis 15 Jahre Brandenburg. And now look at a scene from another masterpiece about a loner who's a killer. Le Samurai, directed by Jean-Pierre Melville in 1967 in France, stars Alain Delon in his best screen performance as an assassin for hire. And Melville's visuals place him at the center of a cold, impersonal world. Qui êtes-vous? Aucune importance. Que voulez-vous? Vous tuez. Here's a famous sequence often imitated from Le Samurai as the killer evades police in a cat and mouse chase on the French subway. Contact rompu. Il est descendu sur le quai de Jourdain. Rétablissez contact à tout prix. Looking at movies like these, you can see the roots of so many later films and you can see greatness. M is unforgettable above all because of its faces. Faces of the police, the criminals, and the killer who all seem to rank about the same in Fritz Lang's estimation. And Le Samurai is a fascinating study of the existential hero, a man who has no reason to live or die and exists only to be consistent with his code. Both films are playing in revival houses. They'll both soon be available on video. And we're talking about greatness, and you've nailed exactly why. When I saw the shot, the great shot in the courtroom, I thought of all the movies that we've seen today that never show the people. Yes. The background of most movies today, and I know we hammer extras. American movies. They're extras. It, or it's wallpaper or mm -hmm. high-tech metal. Mm -hmm. there, there is not an interest in yeah. humanity. Mm -hmm. And Fritz Lang was clearly interested in that. The human, now we jump ahead to Melville. The human condition, the existential man. This is one of the most influential films in film history, whether people working today know it or not. Because it's influenced them through all of the imitations. Exactly right. And this man, who was so quiet and so ungiving of himself and of his secrets and of his thoughts forces us to think about him to try to read his mind that's and that's a fascinating thing. and that's process. because here's another thing that's missing in movies today the quiet i'm talking about the visual quiet the opening sequence mm -hmm. in the samurai is one of the great sequences oh, in the movies you watch because that. you come up to the screen because no one's throwing fast edits on you or explosions it's amazing you look at the movie for about three minutes before you realize there's a person in the shot yes and when, you, when he takes a drag of his cigarette and you think there's a man on that bed, it's, it's as great a moment as any explosion yes. or car no, crash. greater. Be of course. Because yeah. you're... Think of what happened visually, and I hope the directors out in Hollywood will listen and will watch the picture, obviously, more than listen to us, that your mind in the audience, you're up on the screen, you're searching the image. What am I seeing? Yes. Your yes. focus is yes. with the film, yes. not with leaning back as they throw stuff at you. You can learn from it. When we come back, my video pick of the week, a romance between two very gun-shy lovers. We had a perfect date, and I just wanted to feel like I was saving something for later. But baby, you ain't gotta say nothing for me. I mean, you know, I, I want mine now. This video pick of the week is brought to you by Nestle Raisinets. At the movies or at home, Raisinets. My video pick this week is Love Jones, a romance set in the world of Chicago's middle-class African-American artists and professionals, a world hardly ever seen in the movies. It stars Neil Long as a professional photographer and Lawrence Tate as a novelist. They meet at a poetry night at a music club, and when she turns down his offer for a date, he tracks her down to the apartment where she's house-sitting. Ah, persistence. Be surprised how far I can get you. This would seem to be a romance made in heaven, but it's not. And one of the interesting things about the movie is the way it avoids the usual cliches and shows how easily such a fragile relationship can fall apart. I can't stand to sleep with a woman, and afterwards she just dog you out. You know how y'all do. Don't return any phone calls. Play me off in front of your friends like you don't know me, like nothing ever happened. Love Jones is my video pick of the week. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs up for She's So Lovely with its quirky off-center characters trapped in a world of jealousy and abuse. Good performances. We split on Hoodlum. I thought it did a good job of telling not just a crime story but also a chapter from history. But Gene was tired of the gangland characters and their familiar machinations. Two thumbs up for Excess Baggage primarily because of the loopy performance by Benicio Del Toro as a kidnapper by accident. And two thumbs up for Paperback Romance, the story of a romance between a writer of erotic novels who has a secret of her own and a jeweler who may not be able to handle that secret. 
And two thumbs up, of course, for two great classics now in revival around the country. M with Peter Lorre and La Samurai with Elaine Delone. I hope they look for those. Yes, those would be great. Uh, remember, you can check our votes and hear our reviews of recent movies at our website. The address, www.siskel-ebert.com. And that's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including Fire Down Below, starring Steven Seagal as an undercover agent, tracking criminals in the Black Hills, and also the comedy Julian Poe with Christian Slater as a drifter adopted by a small town. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.